Um, welcome to this webinar on the use of digital tools to co-create urban spaces with your residents. Um, apologies about the delay again. Let me just quickly introduce uh, myself and Citizen Lab. As some of you um, pro probably already know from previous webinars, my name is Laura and I lead the business operations for Citizen Lab in the UK. As an impact-driven company, we provide local councils, but also public and private organizations with an online engagement platform. If you are interested in learning more about the work we do, do not hesitate to get in touch either via me, email, or by requesting a demo on the website. <clears throat> Today, however, we are going to hear from two London councils on how they are using digital tools to engage their residents around planning and regeneration projects. Most of our attendees are local councils or engagement practitioners, which is why the focus of the webinar will be to share some useful insights on best practices and tips so that you can hopefully leave with a few ideas that you can then incorporate in your day to day work. So grab a pen and paper and um, enjoy this session. Um, before I introduce the speakers, let me just give you a quick a few quick housekeeping rules. Uh, first one is really around the structure of the webinar. We'll start with a quick round of introductions, followed by a rather informal fireside type chat with our guests for about 30 minutes and then we'll wrap it up with a quick round of Q&A's. Feel free to drop any questions you have down in the chat but we will cover them um, at the end during the Q&A session and this webinar will be recorded so I will be following up with an email to all of those who registered either at the end of this week or early next week. And now without further ado, let's turn to our guests. Um, I'm very happy to have here with me today, Jonathan McClue, Deputy Team Leader for Planning and Regeneration at the London Borough of Camden. Jonathan has actually been working on a playbook for digital engagement and he'll be telling us more about that in a bit. Hi, Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Hi, Laura, great to be here. I'm looking forward to sharing more about our project and the various things we're up to. Sounds great, thank you. Um, could you maybe just quickly introduce yourself and maybe tell us a little bit more about what drives your passion for resident engagement? Sure, so I'm, I'm Jonathan McClure and I'm a deputy team leader at Camden Council. So I mainly sit in development management and I work on some of the largest schemes in the borough and I co-manage a team. Uh, what, I mean, I kind of, to be honest, I fell into planning through university. I've always had a passion for the natural and built environment. And obviously I care about communities and cultures and I've always, I um, enjoyed working with people very closely um, after traveling the world randomly and doing seasonal jobs. I came to the UK and uh, I guess a rich culture and history and built environment here dragged me into planning. And for me, communities and people are the heart of, of the planning process. This is so fundamental to it. And good planning decisions are always based on good, proper community empowerment engagement. So it's always been a passion of mine and I try and work really hands on with communities and all the various stakeholders and it's the part of the job I actually enjoy the most. Great, very extensive. Thank you so much. Sounds fascinating. Um, and our second guest is Eleni Catrini, Senior Regeneration Manager at the London Borough of Newham. Eleni has actually been using the Citizen Lab platform for a few months now um, on a number of regeneration projects. Hi Eleni, thank you for joining us as well. Hello Laura, thank, hello and thank you for the invitation to join you no today. Worries. No worries at all. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself? And I know that you have quite a few projects um, apart from um, sort of beyond your work at Newham. So it would be interesting to hear what drives your um, sort of passion um, around resident engagement. Yeah, so I, I am a designer and, and researcher with kind of experience in, in academia, local government, uh, um, Private, but also volunteering sector. So I've kind of jumped around the different uh, uh, different sectors, which I think is, is useful to start understanding how kind of forming our cities uh, work. Um, my research and practice generally focus on the fields of urban common sharing, sustainability. Um, and participatory design. So I enjoy kind of exploring uh, everyday social life through participation, research and visual storytelling. Um, and in general, I've always been passionate about kind of working with residents and organ local organizations to make cities more uh, environmentally regenerative, uh, but also kind of socially inclusive places to, to be. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Perfect. This is going to be a fascinating conversation, I think. Um, maybe we could just kind of start by a quick overview of some of the flagship 
projects that you both work on, just to give it a little bit more kind of, um, make it a little bit more tangible for the attendees to understand what exactly it is that you work on. So maybe Eleni, you could start us off and just give us a few examples of projects that you've been working on with the London Borough of Newham, where resonant engagement has been a, a quite a big focus. Yeah, definitely. So in Newham, I'm leading the Newham High Streets program, which aims to create strategic plans for the borough's town centres based on evidence and participation. Um, uh, and through the program, we're aiming to kind of rethink not only how kind of uh, not only what the Newham's high streets kind of uh, look and feel like, uh, but also how they're being used, how they're being uh, and a little bit kind of reimagine uh, what the future of the high street could be like, especially kind of in light of the, kind of the recent pandemic as well, and how uh, these kind of local places can recover. Um, within my kind of closer team and beyond, uh, I, I'm, I'm focused may, more, may, mainly about this project, but beyond uh, Newham High Streets within my team, we're working on kind of several area regeneration projects. So varying from public realm interventions to uh, market improvements, redevelopment of strategic sites, and we're generally working on non-residential areas and sites. Of course, as we're placed within regeneration, within our wider regeneration department, we also have estates regeneration and housing delivery programs that are also uh, have engagement processes um, that are quite uh, intense. Sounds great. And for the attendees, we will be having a look at the platform, the digital platform that Eleni uses for those um, projects. So, um, so yes, that will be for in a few minutes time. Um, in the meantime, Jonathan, could you maybe give us a few examples of projects that you're involved with? I remember we spoke about Houston Station when you and I first met, um, but could you maybe give a, a few examples of projects that, you know, where resident engagement is particularly important um, in Camden? Sure, well, Houston Project is, is definitely one of the biggest things happening in Camden and, and in London and potentially the UK. And I mean, the residents there have been, um, they've got fatigue from consultation with all the various works of HS2. And it's going to be really challenging for us to engage with those communities. There's, there's lots of groups, there's lots of disadvantaged groups and Regis Park Estate, for, uh, for example. Personally, I work on large regeneration schemes in Camden. So one of the larger projects I'm in, is around Kentish Town. We've got the Kentish Town Planning Framework and that includes the Murphy's Yard site, which is a large industrial estate and they're decanting to Hemel Hempstead. And then there's a Regis Road site, which has a very large UPS compound and it's got about nine or 10 different developers. And we're looking at working with the GLA to bring forward a master plan. And then we've got Gospel Oak Estates as part of council owned region. So I'm working on large projects of that scale. Um, also, I'm involved in a digital engagement project. So we got some funding from the MHCLG. And as you mentioned in the introduction, we're looking at creating a digital playbook or a toolkit. And we're also looking at creating a digital site notice, which will be a digital twin of the site notice we commonly see on lampposts. And we're also looking at potentially enhancing the, the, the physical hard site notices. So those are some of the main things that um, I'm involved in at the moment. Sounds great. A lot of variety in, in both of your projects, so that's really interesting. I'm sure that our attendees can identify with at least one of those. Um, let's maybe move to um, a second sort of point and talk a little bit more about the main challenges around resident engagement when you work on planning and regeneration a project. I imagine there will be a little bit of overlap, but maybe Jonathan, you can start us off on this one and talk a little bit about the, the challenges that you usually face when you have to engage residents on such big projects. Well, I think genuinely reaching all parts of the community is the biggest challenge for us. We we did quite a far look at the demographics, like what, where we commonly get consultation responses from, and that's to plans and frameworks and to planning applications themselves. And it's typically the same parts of the community. It's um, middle class, it's male, it's white backgrounds. And that's obviously not a fair representative representation of all of society. So that's the biggest challenge for us is engaging all parts of the community. And I think a big issue, a big part of the problem is the accessibility and openness and usability of information. So when a local plan gets consulted on, for example, it, usually the whole document and a very large evidence base gets put online or, or gets put in a library. Uh, when a planning application is submitted, again, it's just reams of PDFs online and it's, it's lots of information to dig through. It's really hard to grasp. So for me, that's the biggest challenge is reaching a wider audience, but also making the information adaptable and so they can engage in it properly. And the digital divide is obviously a key 
a key point, I think, is still an issue of accessibility to IT systems and also digital engagement doesn't always work. It's not appealing to everyone. Personally, I quite miss the face-to-face -face when we have our public forum meetings. I used to enjoy it. You'd go along and you'd have your co coffee or tea or biscuits and you'd have a chat to people in the community and you meet people and make connections. You just can't really replace that online. So I think those, those are the kind of challenges we're facing. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I completely agree. I think that digital engagement is such a great tool to centralize and to make sure that you don't miss out any sort of information, that you reach out to different groups, that, but ultimately it's not a panacea. You need a little bit of everything to make it work really and appeal to different types of communities and profiles. Um, Eleni, I'm just wondering if there's anything you wanted to add, any other challenges apart from inclusion, accessibility, the digital divide that you wanted to sort of um, to point out? Yeah, I think I, I do agree kind of, you know, the levels of engagement and how inclusive we're being and making sure, you know, kind of all the voices are heard are also issues that we're having. I think also, you know, that is connected tightly to kind of the pace of engagement. And also, you know, what happens now that, you know, we're remotely how we're changing to digital engagement, but are we changing maybe the pace that we're doing things to make sure that, you know, we, we're kind of getting people um, along in the process process. Um, I think both in digital and kind of face-to-face -face engagement, how the um, how the, the councils are making uh, their processes transparent, uh, as, as, as transparent as possible and informing people of how long things take, you know, even changing a timing on a traffic light can be really complicated, but, you know, people don't necessarily understand that or have the knowledge of, of what it takes, you know, in, internally for us um, to change some things and how long things take. So it has to do a little bit with managing, I think, the expectations, which is also related to the, the pace or from engagement to actually making change. Um, and I think for us also, it has to do, you know, as Jonathan mentioned about engagement fatigue, I think it has to do with kind of coordinating our engagement processes. Uh, you know, councils are very big organizations and touching upon kind of all the different aspects of kind of people's lives and our neighborhoods and our cities. So it's very kind of um, difficult sometimes to align uh, and so people end up that people getting kind of tired with having to tap into different networks or engagement opportunities uh, in order to drive change in uh, their communities. Mm. No, that makes um, complete sense. And because we're talking about um, digital engagement today, it would be quite interesting to hear which tools both of your councils use to engage and how those tools may have helped overcome a few of those challenges that you face when engaging with, um, with the public. So I don't know, maybe Eleni, you can start us off on this one and then Jonathan can add in. Um, info. Yeah, sure. Um, so we decided started using Citizen Lab uh, as a response to COVID really, as most of our engagement in regeneration was happening either offline through workshops and town hall meetings or through paper surveys uh, via post or at our local libraries. Um, sometimes, sometimes and some teams were working with digital tools, for example, um, using online surveys or using kind of online micro websites to put out information uh, outside of kind of the council's um, uh, main website. However, there were a lot of challenges around that. The first one was that, you know, of course, different teams were using different me, uh, means which led to multiple websites, multiple survey platforms, and of course, kind of confusion from the point of view of the, of the audience. Um, and another issue usually is that, you know, just a typical website that you will put out information. It almost was working as kind of somewhere to deposit information and it wasn't interactive at all. And it also would take a lot of effort to, to put together, right? So it was uh, maximum effort with very low uh, value in terms of how we're engaging um, uh, with people in the borough. Um, as our stream of engagement kind of dried up a little bit due to the pandemic. So we have to, we had to engage uh, in different ways and invent new different ways. Uh, and that's how we, we launched the UM Co Create platform on Citizen Lab. Um, and the platform has helped us expand our engagement in certain cases, but most importantly has helped us kind of um, start organizing, as I said, our engagement and trying to bring in different teams kind of uh, 
on one place, um, creating a place where residents can find different engagement processes that are happening uh, close to them. Uh, we still have a lot of way to go, but at least we're kind of starting uh, uh, to do that and start to building that capacity. We're also using, um, usually for our online meetings and our online workshops, we're using Zoom just because it's something that, you know, due, due to the pandemic kind of exploded and most people are using it. So a lot of our residents or the stakeholders that we're engaging with kind of are familiar uh, with that. Um, uh, and we're using social media outreach, of course, um, the type form integration with, uh, citizen lab for our surveys uh, was quite good. Um, and I think we will continue to kind of uh, use that. Um, there are still different teams kind of using different engagement platforms outside of citizen lab, but we're hoping that slowly uh, we'll all move towards one place. Mm. Sounds great, perfect, very, very extensive. So Jonathan, I don't know if there's anything else that you uh, wanted to add to that. I'm also interested in hearing whether you use any tools to so, show sort of 3D planning, anything mm -hmm. which is more visual and more kind of planning related that would be quite interesting also for us as an organization to see what we can integrate within the future to meet the needs of, um, of you know, our local councils that are working around planning and regeneration. Sure, so I mean, Camden was actually well placed when the pandemic hit us because we've been paperless for about six or seven years and we've all got flexible working kits so we've got laptops and we work remotely anyway and so we've been using things like Skype and MS Teams and Zoom for, for some time and we actually made a switch a few years ago to get rid of um, neighborhood letters so we don't send letters in the post anymore we have what's called electronic alerts and so people can subscribe to those and you can subscribe to a certain postcode or address and then you get an email when an application comes in and then with our site notices we've got qr codes on them so they can link to the website um, but apart from that so in development management we had to quickly flip to putting planning committee online it had to become fully remote so we were the first service and the council to have a, a planning committee uh, have a committee meeting via ms teams and so we basically set up the guidance and had, and we had were the first one uh, we've also been using commonplace so commonplace has been used by our policy and our plan making team uh, so we, for example we've got a site allocations document and that's gone through uh, commonplace and also we've got various frameworks and neighborhood plans um, we have something called development management forums at Camden, and those are typically town hall meetings where uh, at a pre-application stage where the developer presents a scheme and it's a Q&A session. So we had to switch that to a remote forum and we actually use something called Councils UK, who are a public sector version of Community UK, and we made that process fully remote. Um, in terms of, uh, we've also set up probably the country's first remote citizens assembly. So uh, they've done great work. Our regeneration team and Gospel Oak, we've uh, selected a citizens assembly about 126 people. And we've had various Zoom meetings and really got those, that part of the community engaged in trying to form a, a plan. In terms of 3D modeling, I think that's where planning has a lot of, of work to do. I think I, I see a future where people don't submit 2D drawings anymore. Everything will be, a 3D model and it's a great way to get schemes across and I know that View City for example are doing work with Kensington and Chelsea and they're looking at being able to go online online, and you can basically see all the various schemes plotted on a 3D map so uh, there's other various products out there and I've heard of something called LANU and LANU uh, they, they look at the planning possibilities of your site you can put in your house and it shows you what you can build under PD it's a 3D map so I think that has a lot of work, but to be honest, overall, I think planning has a lot of a long way to go to overcome all the challenges. I think uh, we've still got a lot of work to do, and that's what part of our we're working with FutureGov to make a make a toolkit, as I said. And our project is really, really keen to enhance um, consultation from beginning to end. Mm. Great, and um, I mean, I think this is a nice sort of. Um... Uh, transition to make to the playbook that you're working on, which is such a huge part of your work at the moment. Um, I'm very eager to find out, and I'm sure the attendees as well, what is actually going to feature in that playbook, when we can expect it to come out, and how it's going to benefit uh, practitioners in planning and regeneration. Sure, so it's essentially a toolkit 
where local authorities can adapt and learn about digital engagement. So it'll be the vision at the, mo at the moment. We, we're still working on the content with FutureGov, but it could be an online interactive guide. So you could go in and you could, say, you could say what part of the planning process you're in, and you might say we were trying to target a specific community and the, the toolkit will have various products and tools that you can use. It will also have case studies and guides, um, and it will also detail how feasible and um, how much resources are required. I know procurement's always an issue for local authorities. So it will set all, all this out. Uh, we're still w building a prototype with FutureGov. We're applying for continuous funding from MHCLG. We've got our interview with them at the start of February. So hopefully we get more money and we can keep our project going. Um, but we're hoping to get to get something out this year. And I think with the pandemic and everything going digital and the white paper, the way that's going with the, with, the, with the planning system, I think it's really important for local authorities to adapt and the, the toolkit is, is going to help them build that. And obviously um, statements of community involvement are going to have to change. And we've done a bit of work looking at the various state, statements of community involvement of various authorities and they differ widely, I think, potentially we could build a prototype statement of community involvement so local authorities know how they can um, ad adapt their current SCIs so to factor in the current situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are, we are looking for partners to work with us and to help us. We actually have a questionnaire at the moment. So we're really keen to find out from other authorities what they've been doing. So what they were doing before the pandemic, what they're doing now and how successful they've been. So mm -hmm. the toolkit we, we are open to working with as many local authorities as we can. So please reach out to us um, and come along to our show, show and tells. Yep, and I'd be happy to share the link with all of our attendees. If anyone is interested in reaching out, they would be able to fill in the questionnaire. Um, sounds great, perfect. Um, I think, Eleni, maybe now is a good time to go and have a look at your um, digital platform, have a look at maybe one or two of the projects that you're currently um, hosting. Um, I will be sharing my screen. Um, so just guide me through, you know, the platform and where you want me to go, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Let me just share my screen. There we are. Not sure if everyone is able to see this. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, we started the the new and co-create platform, which is basically kind of our citizen lab for a uh, citizen lab platform for a new year because of the of the pandemic. This is what we're mostly doing now, uh, mostly digital, uh, which of course is not you know what we will be doing normally or um, you know. Uh, I think is the best way to, to kind of combine. But as you can see, the, the new Mcom Create platform, as we call it, we have a range of different projects. So if you scroll down, you know, there is kind of housing, uh, delivery, there is the Queen's Market and Hamaraga Capacity and Viability Study, the new M High Streets program. Uh, we had the Good Growth Fund uh, that was successful for Queen's Market to do, to start, if we, we can actually click on that, to have different programs uh, no, the f further down. Sorry, Laura. This one here. Yeah, this one. Um, we've developed different uh, kind of uh, projects around Queen's Market, such as a creative and well-being space, uh, improvements to the markets, and as well as the public realm around that. Um, so we had different projects, uh, ideas put out, and people kind of uh, commented uh, and voted on them. Um, if we go back to projects, we also um, have the kind of the strat for master plan um, that is running. Uh, the projects have started kind of increasing. Um, with Stratford Town Centre Master Plan had kind of the open uh, idea submission from residents. Um, and so they are now, I think the collection of ideas process kind of finished uh, uh, a month or two ago. Um, so in a sense, we've used uh, a lot of the different tools and for, for Newham High Streets, uh, we have done uh, the first phase of engagement, which included kind of a survey that was open. Uh, we are working on four areas for the phase one of the program. Um, and hopefully we'll keep working on kind of uh, 
more areas as we move move on on different phases of new high streets because uh, new has about 19 19 town and local centers um so we have used the platform kind of in all these different ways from surveys project ideas submissions around projects participatory budgeting as well in order to kind of prioritize uh certain projects moving forward um we have also opened i think what was interesting we have opened opened certain projects so that the community can uh, comment openly about the ideas um and we kind of stayed out of some of the discussions deliberately to see how people will interact with each other uh, we used a lot the back office uh, analysis tool uh, to help interpret some of kind of the sentiments of people's comments uh, and benefits it from the engagement statistics that the platform um, offers, such as demographics, age groups, knowing who is kind of engaging with us. We also linked it to both very limited face to face engagement that we have done over the last uh, couple of months, as well as the online workshops that I mentioned uh, before. So we've been running the platform now for about, I would say, nine months. Uh, we've done it more incrementally rather than kind of make it as a big opening, I would say, um, and try to increase capacity as we go both on the number and types of projects we're doing, but also kind of building as you, our, user, uh, our user base. That sounds um, great. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, just wondering if I can uh, ask you a few follow up questions yeah. on that as well. Um, would you be able to tell us maybe what works what works better digitally um, in terms of resident engagement? Is there anything that is easier with with the tool rather than having to do it face to face? Yeah. Um, so. I mean, my experience, I know I'm a little bit biased about that, and I know that we're talking about digital uh, engagement, but I really want to focus that my experience, not from only using Citizen Lab, but other platforms as well in the past, and for different projects, is that one cannot do only digital or face-to-face -face engagement, right? If we want to be as inclusive as possible and provide different means and methods for people to get involved, we need to remove potential barriers and make the process uh, more inclusive by create, offering the different options, right? Mm -hmm. um, the good thing about digital engagement is that it can provide with kind of a larger audience and larger numbers of engagement quite easily. Um, so you can widen up your target audience, which kind of Citizen, Citizen Lab has managed to do for us if we compare with some kind of previous project, similar projects that we were doing um, without using any uh, digital platform. Uh, so we were able to kind of reach people that we wouldn't before and maybe do it with less kind of resources because for example, if we were to compare it, the, the kind of the online survey and that we've done through the platform uh, to some of the processes through paper surveys and collecting uh, them back and kind of analyzing handwriting and all that, it's, you know, it's making that a lot more effortless in a, in a way. Um, and of course, we're not as you know far away as 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 Compton in that sense because we are we were in the mid in the middle of actually turning uh, to kind of smarter working when the pandemic hit in Newham. So the other thing is, I think that younger populations might be uh, also more interested in engaging digitally, um, as well as people with more limited time, such as let's say working parents. You know, they might it might be more easy to engage quickly online at their own time rather than you know visiting a community center during a winter weekday evening, right? So. Um, and I think, as I, I think I mentioned before, the platform has helped us start mapping and organizing how we're engaging uh, with residents across projects um, and how we're engaging in specific uh, places and specific communities, making easier to kind of re-engage uh, with them in the future. Mm. Yeah, because there's really digital engagement, there's one kind of um, advantage, which is really about raising the levels of engagement, but the other aspect of it is really improving the internal processes within the organization and making sure that there are no data silos, that everyone kind of joins together, is able to access the same information and contribute, which is um, really interesting. Um, I'm wondering on a more kind of anecdotal note, uh, did you get any particularly interesting insights on the projects that you were um, hosting on the platform, something that came up from residents that you thought was particularly interesting and maybe you would not have um you know had access to without the platform 
Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that I didn't expect is that I was I was prepared to have a lot more younger uh, kind of uh, population um, that was engaging with us. But it's not true, especially for Newham High Street. You know, uh, the engagement sp span from like 20 to 25 years old up to 70 to 75 and beyond. Um, and that means that, first of all, I don't know if it is given kind of our situation, which is there's a lot more digital engagement in all aspects of our lives uh, but I feel that kind of the older generations um, uh, can adapt quite easily digitally more than I expected at least um, and I think the important thing to keep in mind with younger population is you know even if you have an engagement platform they might not necessarily kind of engage with that you need to tap into their existing kind of networks and social media um, they use already in order to be able to involve them right uh, and kind of bring them allure them in I guess in, into the process um, so we need to be a little bit more creative with that yeah and another um another insight i think was the the way that you know when you have of face-to-face uh workshops right or when you're doing surveys it's almost like a blind a blind process so the platform has helped in certain cases kind of making things more transparent and allowing for people to talk to each other or different stakeholders to talk to each other without kind of our involvement necessarily which was good because i feel that people in certain cases think that you know uh, there are certain areas where we're trying to kind of maybe push of our ideas where it, where what we're trying to do is literally kind of manage and navigate the different voices and opinions uh, across the borough and across different stakeholders around certain issues and projects. So it's interesting to see people kind of discussing about those issues between themselves without us um, kind of uh, carrying that message, I, I would yeah. say. Great, sounds really interesting. It's also, for me, it's quite interesting to see when we think about planning and regeneration, often we think about mapping tools. Um, and obviously you can use that, but it's quite interesting to see that you also use a participatory budget tool that you use, um, collection of ideas, crowdsourcing of ideas, surveys. It's really good to, um, to see as well that there's such a variety of tools that you can use to be a little bit more creative. Um, perfect, thanks so much for walking us through that. That was um, really, really interesting. Um, maybe we can, we can kind of try and take a leap forward. And Jonathan, um, I know that you do a lot of research on digital engagement, I was wondering if maybe you could give us an idea of what we can expect um, to happen in terms of developments in the next few years. How do you see councils changing their behavior and the way in which they engage their residents? Um, and of course, I mean, COVID has a huge role um, to play in that change of behavior, but it would be interesting to see what, what your take is. Sure. Well, as I touched on, the planning system is very complex and complicated and inaccessible for, for lots of people and the non-planning professionals. And I think that needs to change. I'm already seeing a change in the system that data is heading towards being more open and, and transparent and accessible. For example, viability appraisals used to be um, commercially sensitive and we wouldn't even put them on the register. Now they have to be on the public register. They're not redacted. Now there's a presumption to share information. And I think that's where the planning system needs to go. We need to uh, make the planning system more user friendly. So when you go online, instead of seeing a list of PDFs to open up, um, why can't the information be there and easily to assess? So it will tell you how many units, and then you can you can easily find out all the statistics and information about what the proposal includes and what the community benefits are, and how that you as a resident can interact with the development and make suggestions because quite often when people feedback to the local plan or to a planning application, they write long letters or they make comments, but it'd be good to get more useful engagement from the beginning to the very end. And people, they might object to the print, they might object to something in principle due to its height and scale, but can we get more useful feedback out of them? What public benefits do they want to see? Do they want apprenticeships in a certain sector? What what do they want in terms of local procurement? What do they want the local spending to go towards? Have they got ideas for projects? So I think active and early engagement and genuine empowerment is where the planning system needs to head. And as I said, information should be open and transferable to all. The GLA are also they recently updated planning application forms. So whenever you submit a planning application in London now, there's far more. De there's a lot more detail you need to submit. And again, the way the white paper, the vision of the white paper is for local plans to be more digital, for them to be led by neighbourhoods 
and for them to be shorter documents. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's what we'll see. I mean, that part of the white paper to me is progressive and, and good for thinking. It's obviously challenging how a local authority is going to make these plans. How do they have the technical expertise and will they get the support? But mm -hmm. obviously the end goal and the overall vision does have merits to it. And so I think that's where I hope we end up, that it's a more fluid and um, a, a more engaged uh, process overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think although COVID is kind of a trigger for all of this, it is something that has been happening. Well, we've been kind of expecting it for a while, but because of it, thanks to COVID in a way, we're seeing a bigger kind of a quicker move to more uh, to more digital engagement, but also maybe just a better kind of um, coordination between digital and face-to-face -face and just having a more holistic view of what engagement um, can and should be really. Um, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of more questions for you, and then we're, we're going to open the floor to any questions from the um, attendees. So start typing your questions in the chat. Um, so one for um, Eleni, I was just actually wondering if you could tell us a little about um, how you sort of, what the difficulties are in terms of promoting, you know, the tool, because how do you get the word out about the platform um, amongst your local residents? And what are some of the challenges associated with the promotion and actually getting the, the word out? Yeah, sure. I think, uh, yeah, that, that has been quite um, an interesting process. And, you know, Kai's tried to tap into all the mailing lists that exist across the council uh, and inform about the different projects that are coming on, on the platform. As I said, we haven't done a, a proper kind of launch yet uh, because of the way we kind of started using the platform, but we're hoping to do that within the next couple of months. Um, but, you know, we're trying to kind of use social media as much as possible, a mailing list, getting it out through kind of our, our ward councillors um, and their networks. Um, we also have the community neighbourhood teams, which are quite kind of... Uh, a great resource for, for Newham. So we have officers locally working in kind of our libraries and community centers. So they have quite big net local networks. So they have been a great connection to reach out to the specific areas, let's say for the projects that come up on, on the platform. So it's, it's slowly growing, but yeah, it's going well. Sounds great, perfect. And then um, what should, what exciting projects are you working on at the moment and what should our attendees expect to see from you in the next, um, in the next few months, in the next year really? Uh, is that for me, Laura? Both of you, you can start. <laughs> yeah, um, so we are continuing with some of our current projects such as the new high streets and as I said we hope to expand to other areas as well beyond phase one. Um, we also are going to have the Queen's Market which is already actually on the platform the Queen's Market Capacity and Viability Study um, working with residents to identify you know what their, the, the vision is for the future. Um, we're also trying to get more teams and departments as I said to use the platform so the Royal Docks uh, team will come on the platform so we'll have a lot of projects that are targeted specifically for the royal docks area so quite exciting and uh yeah lots okay. of things coming and up actually maybe it's just worth mentioning for the attendees that if they go on the platform visit the platform i will share a link to it as well in my follow-up email they can go to the queen's market project and actually visualize the report that you've built from that which is i think really interesting and mm -hmm. um, to see what some of the insights have been from digital engagement um, and so on and um, that's great thank you so much jonathan what about you what are you know the sort of the main flagship sort of events for projects between one well, I think in, in the area of public engagement, there's some really interesting projects. You can go on the MHCLG website and look at all the projects they fund. But for me, two of the standout ones are RIPA, which is reducing invalid planning applications, which essentially is, is wants to make the whole system more automated. So more applications would come in, less would be invalid, it would be a quicker turnaround. So that is quite a, a good, and it could be a, a game changing or an industry changing project. And there's also, back office planning system or BOPS. And that um, again is making a system as I was explaining, it would be more user friendly. So inf information and data would be submitted in a more user friendly format, which then planning officers when they assess application, they've got all that to hand. And then when we consult 
to, to the public, the information is more accessible to them as well. Um, I've touched on our, our projects in terms of the digital engagement team, but also there's, there's lots of big schemes ha happening in Camden. We've also got a high streets renewal project similar to Newham. Uh, we've got the Euston Master Plan, which Dan and Lise are, are, are working with us and quite heavily on. Uh, in Kentish Town, we've got three really large regeneration sites, so there'll be probably a couple thousand homes all up in there. There's the Murphy site, as I touched on, and the Regis Road one. Uh, in Camden Goodyard, also the Morrison site in Camden Town, that's coming forward. They're on site now. They've de they're starting to demolish the superstore, and they've got a temporary store where the petrol station was, and out in the O2 site on Finchley Road. Again, that's another circa 1,000 homes. So we've got loads of big developments, and also we've got lots of institutions in the Knowledge Quarter in Camden. So uh, we've got the Great Ormond Street Hospital looking at expanding their master plan. UCL have various projects, British libraries coming forward. Uh, we've got Belgrove House, which is going to be another Knowledge Quarter use. So there's lots, lots going on in our Alpara. Very, very busy year ahead. <laughs> definitely, definitely a busy year ahead. <laughs> Sounds great. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's turn to the attendees questions maybe now. I don't know if both of you can, can see the chat, but if I just read them out for you. Uh, one uh, question coming from Cassie is, can you um, sort of analyze the type of people that are using the platform? So I think that's more for Eleni. Um, maybe you could just give us a quick overview of the sort of dashboards that you can use through Citizen Lab. Uh, yeah, you can you can see how many active users there are, and it, depending on um, how we have kind of set up a list of questions when people uh, sign up for the platform. So um, I think we have uh, gender, age. Um, I think general location or which ward or neighborhood kind of they're they're based in. Uh, of course, these are things that people kind of do fill in or not so but based on this we can then understand you know which ages are more popular uh, uh not popular they're kind of the what's the median age i guess of, of the people who are engaging um also which projects they're engaging with so uh which projects have received let's say more comments and feedback compared to others um and and with geographic areas i guess they're located in mm -hmm. so we try to keep the we try to keep those kind of sign up questions as uh, few as possible uh, because a lot of we know that a lot of people kind of you know are maybe put off or signing up to another platform and also specifically for high streets we have allowed you know for certain things to be open even if you don't sign up for the platform to make sure that uh you know people engage with the project which of course you know did not allow us to know all of those uh details mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, a second question is coming from Bud asking, how can we address the issue of consultation fatigue that you mentioned? And this is a very sort of wide question. So I don't know if either of you has maybe just a, a piece of advice to share on how to, how to avoid that. I, I will probably answer that question poorly because it's a really big struggle. As I said on Houston, I mean, I feel very, very sorry for those residents They've had their, I feel sorry for children who have grown up and their whole lives have they've seen lorries going past their front window and have just had con construction project after construction project and there's more and more to come. Um, and consultation fatigue is something we're really worried about in, in Houston. And I think we really have to be innovative, but I think setting up community reps is, is quite, can, can work and working very closely with the community also parts of the community sometimes have a distrust in the developer or even sometimes in the local authority. So you can consider getting an independent body. But I think it's, as with all, most things in our profession, it's about the relationships and the, uh, that you form. So uh, just get on the ground. Uh, obviously, it's going to be great when COVID restrictions li lift and we can meet face to face again. But I, that's what I'm struggling with. Lots of people feeling disenfranchised with the system at the moment so i'm really missing the the, the actual physical meeting so um, it is a really big challenge and actually if if you if anyone else has ideas was we need them for you for, for Houston. we're currently facing that struggle ourselves mm. thank you um ellen i don't know if you wanted to add um, anything to that no i i second what jonathan have said and to, to be honest you know i i do think that I am missing as well kind of the face-to-face -face engagement as well, which 
it does not relate necessarily to fatigue, but I think it, it helps to kind of towards building the relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think for, from doing uh, a lot of kind of online workshops over the last couple of months, I think what I've realized is how challenging, like you we talked about uh, engaging around 3D models and, and things like that. But I'm kind of a great fan of like hands on engagement, like I'm always creating toolkits, card decks, different ways of engaging and of kind of maybe communicating the ideas, which is very, very difficult to do through, you know, video calls. And even though there are a lot of digital tools, it kind of misses of that hands hands on uh, action and even the, the bodily movements that make the whole process a lot lighter yeah. than you know having video call after video call so yeah i do agree that um at least if we don't if we think about of, of how um some of that fatigue could be lift off is to actually combine very in a very kind of smart manner the the things that we're doing digitally and uh, offline as well mm. Sounds really, really interesting. And I think we can all relate to that because, yeah, I mean, Zoom has basically overtaken our lives and I'm also eagerly waiting for a face-to-face -face meeting <laughs> with one of my customers. So I can I can totally understand what you mean. Um, let me see if there are um, more questions. I think I saw one from Lorenzo asking, could digital platforms be designed to strengthen democratic values and culture? Um, I'll just quickly answer this one. Uh, Lorenzo, this is particularly about planning and a regeneration, but we do um, sort of, as citizen as a company we have a mission of improving local democracies and this is just one aspect of it so it depends on how you perceive um democracy but i think giving residents the opportunity to comment on decisions that are going to impact their day-to-day -day life is um is a great expression of democracy so feel free to go on our website and have a look at the blog and um and see how we work on lots of different topics in terms of that um right that's um i think that's pretty much it although um we have one um attendee asking jonathan i'm looking forward to hearing more about the digital toolkit so your toolkit is <laughs> in demand <laughs> um and she is asking whether it will be an open resource for everyone to use which i imagine it will be but the intention is it will be open resource and we want it i mean ideally it would be an interactive thing so it's not just static in time because it's such an evolving field isn't it so I, I have a vision that potentially it could be an online thing and then you could have people submitting more more projects or more more things for the toolkit and we could update it as, as we go along but most certainly it's going to be an open resource and um, we can already share with you the, the spreadsheet we've created of the various uh, things we just don't have the content content part of it sorted mm. I think that I saw a question from Ralph as well asking about yes. projects um, please email me Ralph digital planning at candon.gov.uk and I can, can send you there's there's loads of projects I wish when we when at the start of the pandemic we were like scratching around looking for, for things and I think in the part even in the past few months so many different projects and uh, programs are out there it's really exciting so there's loads of things that you can use and they've all got their various benefits so um, I can impartially recommend a few things to you if you'd like Ralph. Hmm. Um, great. And we have so a new question from Jess. Are there any areas of policy that you've noticed as being barriers for better embracing digital engagement? Um, I guess that's a kind of a question for all of us. But um, Jess, I think that um, maybe I could, you know, tell you a little bit more about the main areas where we see digital engagement really having an impact and answer your question like that. I think that the planning is definitely one of them. Another one is climate change. Um, anything around participatory budget is really um, sort of um, incentivizing for residents. So that's a really good one as well. Um, and um, yes, I would say that these are kind of like the main topics that I think are really at the moment, at the moment gaining a lot of ground. Uh, but I will have a think and um, let you know if I come up with anything else via email. Um, and yes, I don't know. I've actually maybe building on that question, maybe for the two of you to kind of finish off. Um, consultations around planning and regeneration can be quite acrimonious um, and I'm just wondering how can digital tools do digital tools make that conversation a little bit more civil in a way so Eleni, I don't know what your experience is with um, you know the platform and Jonathan your experience with digital tools as well but is it a way to um, kind of you know make it a little bit more civil I think I mean this kind of relates also to another question that Nicola put up 
uh, for um, making sure that you know the different views are not taken over by the loudest voices. And I think at least from the first round where we tested the tool of actually letting people discuss, you know, the different ideas that we put forward uh, without kind of, of us intervening, what I realized is that people were being actually quite civil. Um, I think you would you would imagine that based on kind of how people are on social media, that things would be you know, could get really ugly really fast, but actually they didn't. And and I think that was not surprising because if you actually sign up to engage on, you know, on a platform specifically uh, there for, for you to, to kind of get involved in a, a meaningful way, I think people kind of value that. I mean, a lot of times the conversation might have diverted from the question at hand, but I think there were very, fruitful conversations to be had between different people. Um, and I think the good thing about the, dig uh, the digital platform, it gives different options, even from for the most kind of introverts and the most extroverts. So right, you can have, you know, comments that everyone can see, but also you can, you know, have comments directly sent uh, to, to people who are managing, uh, I guess, uh, the platform, or you can, um, you can have surveys with, you know, can allow for comments. So I think if you mix all of those different tools, then you can get uh, uh, different types of people uh, engaging with uh, with uh, really the project. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. It's uh, eleven fifty-seven. So I think we're going to to leave it here, just just on time, despite the uh, the delay. And um, thank you so much, both of you, for joining me today. It's been a really really interesting conversation. Um, I will follow up with both of you to get the links to those different um, things that we mentioned. And I can send that through to the attendees. I'm thinking particularly about you, Jonathan, to um, to contribute to your project. Um, so again, thanks a lot. Thank you very much to all of the attendees. Um, again, apologies about the delay at the beginning of this session. I will be in touch with a follow-up email, and I will keep you posted about our next webinar, which should be in early March, and hopefully around the topic of inclusion, which I sense is very important for for all of you. Um, so yes, have a have a lo lovely afternoon, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Cheers.